Observer Live, Mike Semper, VV, also of WrestlingObserver.com. So, yes, as I noted to the Twitch homies in the chat right there, those of you that watched the tour of F4W headquarters, that was, in fact, a purple car. And it was my car. I once owned a purple Kia. And the reason for that, I swear to God this is true, I bought the car at night, and it was dark, and I thought it was black. Next day I woke up, sun's out, it's purple. Shut up, Mike. All right, with that levity out of the way. So as noted in the opening segment yesterday, I said, I need to talk to somebody who is in SAG. Everyone's talking about SAG after and pro wrestling and everything like that, and I'm out here bumbling about it. Why don't we get somebody who is actually in SAG to come on and tell us how this would affect professional wrestling? I was bombarded with individuals emailing me. I got so many people emailing me. And this is by far the winner here because this guy sent me a big, long thing about it. And it's not just like he is a SAG member. He is a big-time pro wrestling fan to the point where if I said his name, some of you would know the guy's name. And he also happens to be on the local board for SAG-AFTRA in a major metropolitan region. I can't say his name, obviously, because he's on the board here. But he's written this long deal, and I'm going to tell you about it here. He says, There's been talk about wanting to reach out to WWE for some time. I know for a fact that there's been interest among the talent for years. But the message until now, and perhaps still, this person notes, is that they won't try to organize because of Vince. That may be changing. Some talent who have done outside projects more than likely already are members. We shall see. The first step would be for the talent to file a petition with the National Labor Relations Board. I believe they would need one-third of the talent to say that they are interested in unionizing. One-third of the talent. Then a formal vote would occur. Of all eligible talent as to whether they want to unionize, a simple majority yes vote would be required to pass. So first we would need 30% of the talent to say that they're interested in doing this. And then once the ball is rolling, you would need more than 50% of the talent to vote yes in order for them to unionize. It says, by law, it is illegal for a company to retaliate against any employee interested in unionizing. This, however, can be hard to prove if it's just one person, which is why multiple talents will need to step up at the same time. That creates a strong case of retaliation. As to Twitch, YouTube... OnlyFans, side hustles, etc. That's something that would need to be worked out when WWE and SAG after sit down to hammer out a collective bargaining agreement. Each agreement is different, so that would be unique to WWE. I am not sure whether there is a precedent for this, but I doubt it. If talent votes to organize, the collective bargaining agreement would be the place to address a lot of the other issues that are facing talent. What are some of those issues? Well, base pay. A minimum salary would be established for all talents. It likely will increase based on how long a person has been with the company. For example, Titus O'Neil is not making Randy Orton money, but he has been around for a while. His salary should be higher than a fresh call-up from NXT, regardless of whether he is used on TV or not. Cannot guarantee that because it will be negotiated. That's generally how it works. This would also apply to any enhancement talent or extras who would be brought in. The CBA will likely establish what is called a daily hire rate for them. That is a minimum flat fee that they are paid for their services. However, this can be a sticking point, too, because it is unlikely indie wrestlers being used would be members of the union. So the union would have to agree to a one-time waiver for them. Union or not, they would still be afforded the same daily hire rate. Now, quite frankly, from what I know about people that have worked as extras for WWE, there is a daily minimum pay rate for those, those individuals. I think it used to be like $500. I don't know what it is now, but... Basically, if they started touring again and they came to Seattle and they wanted to use Caden Matthews, for example, he would get a minimum base daily rate to be an extra. So this really wouldn't change much for the extras brought in. You negotiate travel expenses, including to non-televised events, hotel, car, etc. They pretty much already do that. Time off. Whether or not talent gets a couple of weeks off each year can be negotiated here. This one might be tough for talent to get if WWE does not resume its old touring schedule. However, maternal and paternal leave can be negotiated along with regular sick days. 
obviously in WWE, if you're sick, you get the day off anyway. They wouldn't use you. And, I mean, you know, some talent does negotiate time off in a WWE. I mean, some of them already have that worked into their contract. So they already kind of have that. Insurance can negotiate whether talents would get insurance and retirement through the union or the plans offered to WWE employees. Upside for talent here is the union offers a pension and a source of income post-retirement if they're vested or paid into it long enough. However, a lot of companies prefer to keep those things in-house because it's easier for them logistically. That would likely mean the option for talent to participate in any retirement plan 401k WWE offers employees. So what that would mean, obviously, is a lot of people have said, look at all these old wrestlers. Why doesn't Vince throw them some money? Look at the pensions in the NFL, etc. Well, the difference is, I mean, in the NFL, you would be paying into whatever is paying you back for your pension when you retire. All of these old wrestlers, they never paid into WWE to get that pension. So that's probably why WWE is obviously, you know, they're not just throwing money to everybody. Although, you know, they kind of, it's not really a pension, but they can sign older wrestlers to the Legends deal, where every year you get $10,000 or whatever it is. It actually might be only a one-time fee, I'm not even sure, but whatever. So in order for WWE to be paying pensions, if you're a worker, that would mean that throughout the year, whatever you're getting now, let's say you're making, just throw out an easy number, $100,000 a year. You wouldn't be getting $100,000 a year. You'd be getting less than that because a portion of that would be paid into your pension fund. So you would get a pension after you're done with WWE. So a lot of the talent now, not everybody, but a lot of them have already set up their own, their own 401ks or whatever, their SEPs, whatever it is. So that's how they're getting their pension after they're done with wrestling. So this would make it a little bit different if this were agreed to when you're doing your collective bargaining. A strike would only occur if authorized by the union and as a last resort. That's why they're so rare. You hear a lot about it when a strike occurs, but don't be fooled into thinking it happens a lot. It doesn't. Neither side wants to get to that point because income and revenue will plummet for all parties. Drugs and alcohol. Chance of the talent wellness policy will be folded into CBA. It is common in other sports. Penalties, violations, etc. would be negotiated. Potentially, that would clear the way for any current policies against marijuana use to be lifted. I'm sure a lot of current wrestlers would be interested in that one. NBC, Universal, and Fox aren't going to care if talent unionizes because 99% of their shows already fall under the SAG after Umbrella. Same thing with any WWE Studios projects. And if this goes through, good chance wrestlers would not be the only ones covered. Could extend to other on-air talent, announcers, potentially people doing their networks. Uh, their network only shows like The Bump, perhaps even the writers for the website. This would be covered. This is very much a maybe. In newsrooms, a lot of producers and web writers are also part of the union, in addition to reporters and anchors. Establishing a base salary for these guys could be big, because I bet they're being paid pennies right now. And as noted, all of this give or take, there are negotiations after all. Neither side will get 100% of what they want. But talent will absolutely, this is what he says here, talent will absolutely walk away with a lot more than they have now, a hell of a lot more. Now, like I said, I mean, I read all of this. This is the way that it would be. But at the end of the day, I talked to people all day yesterday. And, I mean, this has been on and off since the first WrestleMania and Jesse Ventura. It's never happened. And the feeling among a lot of people is it ain't going to happen now. But that's everything you need to know about it. Like I said, I'm not going to spend weeks discussing this. I mean, aside from Rocky later on in the show, I'm pretty much done. But now you know, and if more comes of this, if a ball gets rolling, if an Andrew Yang does something, we'll talk about it. But until more happens, we're right back where we were prior to WrestleMania 1. Hey, Mike, we're going to get your thoughts after the break, buddy. Thanks. Wrestling Observer Live. If you love these video clips, head down there to the bottom right-hand side of the screen and click Join. For just $7.99 per month, you get full access to all of the episodes, over 300 at current count, full-length episodes of The Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, and Figure Four Daily with both Landstorm and Filthy Tom Lawler. You can also hit that subscribe button, and you'll always be alerted as to when new shows are available.